Welcome everyone to a very sunny Charmwood Forest Geopark here in sunny Leicestershire in the United Kingdom. My name's Jack Matthews. I'm the Geo Heritage Interpretation and Conservation Officer here in Charmwood Forest. And over the next two hours, we're not only going to be showing you some of the spectacular geology, geodiversity, geomorphology, we'll be explaining all of these words too. We're going to be showing you what we have here in Charmwood Forest, but also reaching out to many wonderful friends around the world who want to share their geodiversity with us too. So before we get going and explain why we're doing this today on October the 6th, a very important day, um, because of course today being October the 6th is International Geodiversity Day. And there you can see the wonderful logo designed by Silas over in the Cerrito UNESCO Global Geopark in Brazil. What a wonderful logo he designed for us there to show this concept of International Geodiversity Day. And why does this day exist? Well, you may have come across World Biodiversity Day. You may have come across the International Day for Biosphere Reserves. You may have come across Earth Day and many other days as well, because so many elements of nature, mainly the living ones, have international days that shine a light, a focus on the very important topics of why biotic nature, the nature that's alive, why that's so important. And for many, many years, those days have been celebrated and they act as a point to focus the mind, get the public, get government, get businesses to focus on the importance of those issues. But there was a bit of nature that was missing out, and that was geodiversity. Because biodiversity is only half of na nature, and geodiversity is the forgotten half. So what is geodiversity? Well, it's the variety of the non-living elements of nature, from rocks and soils to fossils, to minerals, to the wonderful landscapes we can see here in Leicestershire and around the world, and also the processes that make, modify, and destroy those features. So that includes things like volcanic eruptions, erosion, and earthquakes. That's all part of geodiversity. And geodiversity has a real significance to all of our lives. It's all around us. It provides the wonderful landscapes that we like to go and explore, to hike around. It's good for our physical and our mental health. It's also very important for things like natural resources. You may not know that your smartphone or the device you're watching this on right now is full of many different elements in the periodic table. And our understanding and our ability to harness geodiversity provides provides those elements. You may have come across things like iron and aluminium, but the device you're watching this on probably has some more unusual things in it. It has lithium. It might even have some tellurium in it. It's probably got some gold and silver in it, and that all relies on geodiversity. Now, we could stand here and talk to you for two hours, but Let's wait to hear a little bit more from some of the wonderful guests that are going to be joining us around the world to hear more about why geodiversity is of real significance. Because just before we introduce our first guest, I want to talk to you a little bit about Charmwood Forest, because we're here in Leicestershire, right in the heart of the United Kingdom. This area um, has been known as Charmwood Forest for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it has some really significant geology. What we find here in Charmwood Forest is about 150 square kilometres of absolutely exceptional and unique geology. And at the core of that, indeed, on the very rocks that I'm standing on now, you will find rocks of around about 560 to 570 million years old. That's from a geological period known as the Ediacaran or the Ediacaran. And there aren't many places in the world where you can find rocks of that age. But when you do, you might find within them some exceptional fossils. And those fossils are key to our understanding of the evolution of life, specifically the point when life got big and animals first evolved. Because life is over 
billion years old. And for most of that time, it's been small and microscopic. But around about 570 million years ago, something changed. And one of the best places in the world to see that change when life got big and animals first appeared is here in the Charmwood Forest Geopark. Maybe later on, we'll have a little bit more time to tell you about some of the amazing discoveries that have been found here, not only in recent times, but going back to the 1950s as well. We're also gonna introduce you to some of our newest fossil friends and some amazing illustrations that have been drawn for us to bring these first animals to life. Now, at this point, I'm going to look towards a, a video that we recently made with the Oxford Policy Engagement Network. It explains what geodiversity is and why we took that idea and why, working with UNESCO, we set up the International Geodiversity Day. So let's play that video now. In so many ways, geodiversity is impacting our lives. And it's been really exciting to see the area that I've worked in for some years get onto the international stage. It's gonna help policymakers respond better to the challenges of tomorrow. I'm an honorary associate at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. I'm interested in geodiversity, which is the variety of the non-living elements of nature. It's everything from rocks, minerals, soils and fossils, to landscapes, rivers. Really, it's the forgotten half of nature. The policy problem we recognised was not enough people in the general public and not enough policy makers are aware of the important role that geodiversity plays in all of our lives. Every ecosystem in the world is underpinned by some form of geodiversity, be that rocky cliffs that provide nesting grounds for birds or the soils that help grow the food that we buy in the shops to eat that provides us with the resources that we need to build the green future of tomorrow like the copper for wind turbines and by better understanding and harnessing geodiversity we can have a more sustainable future. So the best way to do that was to try and establish an International Geodiversity Day so that for one day a year, the focus would be on this really important policy area. So the policy partner for us is UNESCO, which is the Education, Science and Cultural Organisation of the UN. It may seem a large organisation, but we're just a small group of people. Our strength comes from the experts that we're working with. With Jack, we have a somebody who speaks with the with authority in, in his field but who manages to make it understandable to a wider public as well. So we worked with geological organizations at regional, national and international level to get letters of support to show policymakers that this was something of real significance and then from there you go through a quite long process of various meetings within UNESCO to get the final vote in the UNESCO General Conference that this is going to be an official UNESCO event every year on October the 6th. The biggest challenge for policy engagement with the sciences is lack of funding. But the great thing about this project is we had full-time funding from the Oxford Policy Engagement Network so that I could work 100% of the time on this project. I think the main thing that we've learned is that you need strong relationships. We were particularly uh, reliant and grateful to the support we got from the national representatives from the UK, Poland and Portugal. And this probably wouldn't have happened without their help and support. So policy engagement for me is about establishing those relationships so that when the door opens, you already have the connections that you need to create the impact that you want. So there's a, a little video that's telling you uh, about uh, International Geodiversity Day and I should 
say a huge thank you to the leadership provided by Professors Bria, Zvelinsky and Gray, who were great leaders and they are really the brains behind the ideas of geodiversity and, and we couldn't have built International Geodiversity Day without them. But without further ado, we're going to uh, go off to our first guest because you can see on the screen there a, a wonderful map of the world and we're going to be racing around it this afternoon. Maybe it's not this afternoon. A, a rather large gust of wind nearly blew us over there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is what live broadcasting is all about. Um, we're going to be whizzing all around the world. And I should say, if you have any questions, if you put those in the chat, if you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook, if you pop it in the chat, they will pop up on our system and we will be able to put them to our speaker. But the first person we're going to speak to today is Anna, all the way in the Platterbergens Geopark in Sweden. So, good uh, afternoon, Anna, how are you? Hi, Jack. So nice to be with you on this live. Thank you for joining us live today. So, Anna, tell us uh, where you are. Tell us a little bit about the Geopark and tell us what you do for the Geopark there, Sweden's first UNESCO Global Geopark. That's absolutely right. But just before I start doing that, Jack, I just have to say thank you for all the amazing job that you've done uh, the past year here to realize, the, to make this Geodiversity Day come through. I know that you put a lot of time and effort into this, and I think that celebrating the Geodiversity Day, Geodiversity Day all across the globe is something that is really important, as you mentioned, and uh, it, it means a lot to us geoparks and to all people working uh, with geology all around the globe. So. Thank you so much for the amazing job that you've done. Thanks for but, uh, <laughs> but back then a little bit to, uh, to my geopark here. My name is, as you said, Anna Beringren, and I am the manager of Sweden's first UNESCO Global Geopark. It was really about time that we got a UNESCO Global Geopark here in Sweden, because it's not that we don't have geology of international significance here definitely not it, we, we were just a little bit slow compared to our other nordic neighbors but now we're finally here and we got uh, our unesco status in april this year and we're very happy about that and i've been working in this amazing area since 2017 that's when i started with the application process towards unesco uh, and today I'm standing at one of our uh, fantastic geo sites. This is a nature reserve called Silverfalle. It's uh, the name of a waterfall that you can see behind me here. And I must admit that we've had a very, very dry season uh, behind us. So the water that I have here right behind me now is not as much as it normally is. But we, uh, but you still, I hope that you still can see that we have some water in the waterfall here coming down. And if you visit after more rain or in the springtime, it's a huge stream of water coming down here. And I am standing on the slope on one of our mountains, one of our table mountains here in, in the geopark. We have 15 table mountains. Uh, and when you talk about mountains, you might th uh, think about this high. Uh, but in, in our case, our mountains are not so high, but they're a little bit different and they're built in a different way. And uh, I thought I was going to show you a little bit more about that. Wonderful. Anna, keep on going. I lost you a little bit there, Jack. I can't really hear you. Anna, take it. We're going to put you full screen because we want the people at home to be able to see the wonderful geodiversity. So take a few minutes to guide us through what's so special about this site, what's the geology, and uh, yeah, bring it to life for us. Thank you very much. Definitely. I will start by talking a little bit down here, and then we're actually going to walk a little bit further up here uh, to have a look at another geosite. But before we do that, I would like to tell you a little bit more in detail what is so special about our 15 table mountains. Because as I just mentioned to you, they're not so high. 
the highest mountain that we have is only 335 meters above sea level. So that is barely nothing. For a visitor coming to our area and when they see our mountains, they might think that they more, look more like small hills over the, the Vefeta plain that we have here in West Sweden. But what's so special about these 15 table mountains is that they're built in a very special way. They're built of different layers of bedrock. And I have an illustration here that I'm going to show you. I have to put down my book. And unfortunately here it's written in Swedish, but I think that you can still understand. I'm going to have to try to stand here so you can see it in front of the camera. Here is an illustration over the different layers of bedrocks that we have in the table mountains. Down at the bottom, we have the parental rock, and then we have sandstone, alum shale, limestone, shale, and at the top, we have dolerite. So this is what a table mountain is made of. And as you uh, probably know, if you know a little bit about geology, the parental rock that we have down at the bottom is a magmatic rock, it's uh, granite, so gnesis. And the dolerite up on the top is also a magmatic bedrock. And then the four bedrocks that we have here in the middle, they're sedimentary bedrocks. So where we're standing right now at the slope of, uh, of Mount Billingen, we have the waterfall coming down. And uh, the waterfall that we have here, it actually goes in different uh, steps down the slopes. And it passes through the limestone, the alum shale, where we're standing right now. And then it kind of flats out when we come down to the, uh, to the sandstone. Uh, but as you now got a little bit of introduction to the table mountains, we're actually going to walk a little bit further up the mountain side here, and we're going to look into it a little bit more in detail to see what we can find here in the alum shale. So come with me. Thank you so much, Anna, for what you're showing us here. And while you're taking us up past those beautiful views, of course, this is a wonderful example of how geodiversity, it, there are many things that are different about geodiversity around the world. But if we've got any viewers in from Yorkshire today, they'll, of course, be very used to the alum shale, um, which can be found on the Jurassic of the Yorkshire coast. So there are many things that separate us in geodiversity, but there's many things that unite us as well. Um, Anna, where are we now? We walked just a little bit uh, up from where I was a, a few seconds ago, and I wanted to show you what we can find inside of the, the alum shale, because in the alum shale, it's not only alum shale, we can also found rocks of limestone, and this is called an anthraconite. Uh, I'm not really sure if I pronounce it correct in English, so I just used the more popular word, namely stink stone. And I sit with one large stink stone here that I thought that we could talk a little bit about. And these stink stones, they're, they're uh, black or gray limestones that we can find in the alum shale. So if you remember the, the um, the different layers of the table mountain here, we had one separate layer with limestone, but even in the alum shale then, we find limestone as well, and it is this stink stones. And they're embedded as lenses uh, inside the alum shale, and we actually have, uh, it's about a two meter thick layer in the alum shale, which is called the stink stone deposit, where we find most of these stink stones. And they're found in various shapes, the one that I have here is quite large and it's very round, as you can see. But there are also these uh, different types of, uh, of stink stones. Some are more salt-like and made up of different, uh, different crystals. But of course, as you can tell from the name here, they also, these rocks also smell. And that is uh, quite uh, strange with them. And that's why they have this, uh, this name. Uh, it's a large amount of organic material in them. Uh, and if you scrape the rock, which I'm not going to do here because we're in a nature reserve, or if you uh, slam a little bit with another rock on it, it smells of petroleum uh, when, when you strike it. And that's why people in this area have given it the popular name stink stones. Uh, and in, uh, in these limestones, we also find different, uh, different fossils. We find something called Agnostus pisiformis. 
we find trilobite and we also find some brachiopods. So these, uh, these round sphinx stones that we find in the Elim Shale are quite amazing and they tell a very, very interesting story. And I forgot to tell you, but they are about 500 million years old, these, uh, the Elim Shale and the, and the sphinx stones that we have here. So that is quite spectacular. Uh, these sedimentary bedrocks that we have in the Table Mountains, they're deposited from around 550 million years ago and up to uh, the sediment bed sedimentary bedrocks up to 300 million years ago, uh, or sorry, 400 million years ago. And then we have the dolerite on top that were deposited about 280 million years ago. So it's quite old geology that we have here in, in our geopart. Um, but before we, I hand over uh, to you, I thought that we're just going to take maybe the chance to look around here because this is, as I said, a, uh, a nature reserve and we have amazing uh, uh, nature here. We have a broadleaf woodland and a lime loving flora that we have all around us here. And we're going to try to film a little around. Now the trees have got their very nice colors around here too. Um, and you can really tell in this nature reserve the interaction between the underlying rocks and the plant life that we have all around here. Um, and in the forest here, we find a lot of different birds that nest here in the broadleaf woodland. And in the, uh, in the waterfall here, during uh, spring and summertime, we can find gray wagtail and white-throated dippers that live in the, in the waterfall. And a little bit further up here along the slopes, we actually also found another plant that is quite uh, rare, at least to Sweden, namely the ramson or the wild garlic. It thrives where we have these lime-rich soils and it's uh, very specific to the table mountain landscape and you find it along the slopes here. Now we're in a nature reserve, so you're not allowed to pick the, the ramson here. But if you go to other places uh, around the mountains here, it's very popular in springtime for the local people to go out in the woods and pick the ramson. Um, so now you've got a bit of an introduction and I know that we're gonna get back to you in just a little bit. Then we're gonna keep moving a little bit down the, uh, down the mountainside here. And we're going to have a closer look at a very exciting industrial and cultural heritage that we have at this site. Thank you so much, Anna, for taking us through a more than half a billion years of geological history there in the Plata Birkins Geopark, UNESCO Global Geopark in uh, Sweden. Uh, you can see. Um, we are united uh, in going through autumn, but it seems like you're a little bit ahead of us. Um, the mighty leaves of the English oak are slowly coming off here, but we've still got uh, quite a bit of greenery. Now, uh, Anna, are we uh, coming back to you a little bit later in our broadcast? Yes, we are in, uh, I don't know, maybe 20, 20 minutes, half an hour. I don't know, you, you're in charge of the program, Jack, so you, you just let me know when, I, when I'll be live again. Fantastic. So maybe a little bit later on, we're going to go back to Sweden to find a little bit more. You've 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 seen the Alum Show. You've seen the mighty Stinkrox of their geopark, and we're going to find a little bit more a little bit later. So thank you to Anna, and we'll we'll let you go because you've got to readjust where you're going to be in your geopark. Thank you once again, Anna. We're going to see Anna and the Platterbergens team again. Uh, a little bit later on. Thank you once again. Right at this moment, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Charnwood Forest. I'm also going to say that, of course, if you have any questions, if you put them in the chat, as long as you're joining us via Facebook or YouTube, you can uh, put them in the chat there, in the comments, and they'll pop up on our magical system. And I and my friends from around the world will try and answer as many of your questions as possible. I should also say that if you want to find out more about the Charmwood Forest Geopark, you can find us on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. Just search for us there and you can find out more. Now, I've talked a little bit about the fossils and I'm going to tell you even more about our fantastic fossils a little bit later in the broadcast. But this area of Charmwood Forest also has 
2,000 years of mining and quarrying history because around this core of very old rock, which contains some of the oldest animal fossils in the world, we also find a number of important quarries because Charmwood Forest is one of the closest hard rock localities to the southeast of England, which of course, as an area where lots of people live, is also an area that consumes lots of construction products. It needs lots of stone. And so you're going to look for your closest supply because no uh, disparaging comments to our friends in the southeast of England, but your rocks are not the hardest in the world. And so you have to come to wonderful places like this to find them. Now, I don't know if you can notice, I'm going to look in on my screen here. You might might be able to notice um, behind me there's a bit of a, a red color you might be able to see um, a lake that is a Swithland Reservoir, a major source of fresh water. Another example of geodiversity, the topography here in Charnwood Forest, providing a great area to capture water and the Victorian designers here in Leicestershire harnessed that with four reservoirs, Swithland water being one of them, to supply the growing populations of uh, Leicestershire. And there's a little wonderful view of Leicester here, and we'll, we're going to show you that a bit later on. But just the other side of the reservoir, you might be able to see a little red colour in uh, the landscape there. And that is the face of Mount Sorrel Quarry. Mount Sorrel Quarry is one of the UK's largest uh, aggregate quarries. It is quarrying a rock of about 450 million years in age from a geological period known as the Ordovician. And that's a very hard rock because it is an igneous rock. And it formed underground when molten rock, we call magma when it's underground, this molten rock solidified under the surface, creating this big blob of igneous rock that we call the Mount Sorrel Granodiorite. And that's great if you need a very hard rock to provide good foundations for big construction projects. So here uh, with the Mount Sorrel uh, Granodiorite, a lot of the consumption um, from this quarry actually goes out by rail and it supplies currently 50% of the British Rail Network's consumption of ballast. So that's the stones that sit underneath the rails and the sleepers of the train. So if you are going about a train in Britain, there's a good chance that you're riding on a sturdy foundation of rock from Charnwood Forest. And indeed, that, so that's in our geopark. It's one of the few places uh, where you can see uh, Ordovician intrusions because in many places in Britain we only know they are there because of deep surface uh, investigations and surveys but we don't find it on the surface of the earth. We know this string of Ordovician igneous rocks which um, we've got some here but go all the way down to the east towards East Anglia. We know they're under the ground there, but they don't break the surface. And so we're one of the places that you can see this Ordovician story of these 450 million year old intrusions. Um, and just before we go, because we're going to watch a, a little video that we recorded uh, last year uh, about Baden Hill in a moment. But what I will say is just the other side, I don't know what the uh, vision on the camera is like. So if you can't see it, just imagine with me. The other side of the quarry there, there's a, a few white buildings. They're outside of the geopark, but they are the largest gypsum mine in the UK. Gypsum, of course, very important as we make things like plaster uh, and pl Britain that has plaster in it. Um, and that's uh, just the other side of, uh, of there. Now, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to check with my colleague, Helen. Do we have uh, Canada? We're just going to check. We're going to, I'll tell you what, we're going to play the Barben Hill video, uh, which is another one of the quarries in the geopark, and the connection with biology. And then maybe we'll be joining another guest when we get back from that.
So we're here today at Baden Hill, 278 metres above sea level, the highest point in Leicestershire and indeed Charnwood Forest. Behind us you can see Baden Hill Quarry itself produces around 15% of the UK's total annual output of aggregate because it's got beautiful hard rock geology you can see at the bottom of the pit there you can see darker greys and purple type rocks these are Ediacaran age rocks around 580 600 million years old which were deposited around uh, volcanic uh, edifices around volcanic islands in the deep sea during that time but you can see a sharp contrast to the top of the quarry. Those are Triassic rocks, sandstones and mudstones deposited sometime around 200 to 250 million years ago by ephemeral periodic rivers going out into arid environments. And that V shape you can see there at the back of the quarry is an ancient valley formed sometime 200, 250 million years ago in the Triassic you can see the valley that was incised by the rivers and then filled in by the sediments that were deposited there. Probably one of the best large-scale examples of that structure anywhere in the UK. And because there's a gap in time, got roughly 600 million year old rocks at the bottom, roughly 200 to 250 million year old rocks at the top, there's obviously a lot of geology missing and therefore we call that surface an unconformity. And as I say, probably one of the nicest places in Southern Britain to view a large scale unconformity. But this site isn't just about geology. The geology, as everywhere in the world, underpins so much of the rest of our society and our environment. And this is also a really important site for biology. So tell us, Julie, a bit about bit the biodiversity in this area. This area is particularly important um, for invertebrates and particularly for spiders and as part of the Charnwood Forest Landscape Partnership Scheme um, we've, we've got a spider survey which is actually looking at sites like the one here at Baden um, for examples of some of the rarest spiders that we have in the East Midlands and one in particular, the Charnwood spider, is the focus of, uh, of one of the studies that we're carrying out. So yes, whether you're interested in commercial geology and how that supports our economy and society, whether you want to trace back rivers of a quarter of a billion years in age, or you want to track down the elusive Charnwood spider, it's all here on Barden Hill. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, the Charnwood spider, a very, very rare organism that we're not really sure if it's found anywhere else. It's called genus name Mastigusa, um, and it's really only found uh, here. And we here at the Charnwood Forest uh, Geopark, as part of a National Lottery Heritage Fund funded scheme, we're doing 18 projects with partners from all around Leicestershire, not only to to develop uh, the geopark but also to celebrate and protect so many of the aspects here of Charmwood Forest and one of those is uh, spider and we're working with Leicestershire wildlife spider. Now I think we have Sweden back with us. How are you? Oh look at that a wonderful change of scenery. I think you're putting your headphones in. So I shall give you some time while you speak uh, about that and I will just remind people uh, while uh, Anna's popping her headphones in that if you've got any questions, do pop them in the chat. We love your questions. Also, just tell us where you're joining from today. We love to hear about where you are in the world, where you're joining us from, um, who you are. Are you from another geopark? Are you a local resident of Charnwood Forest? Maybe you're in Sweden uh, as well. So, uh, Anna, can you hear us or have we jumped back to Sweden a little bit too early? Not a problem. We're going to give 
Sweden a little bit more time. We'll take them uh, out of the stream. And what we'll do is we'll... I've been telling you all about Charnwood Forest. And so far, I've only shown you wonderful Bragate Park, which is where we are now. And I'll make sure... Uh, and, and the things you can see be behind me. But our friends at the Charnwood Borough Council made a wonderful video called Discover Charnwood, which tells you a little bit more about why this area here in Charnwood Forest is so special and what there is to find here, not just geological, but so many other things too. So let's watch Discover Charnwood. It's time to discover Charnwood. Perfectly located right in the center of the country and enjoying superb transport links, there is no better place to visit, work and live. For nearly 600 million years, the powerful forces of nature have been sculpting our breathtaking landscapes. Evidence of our unique geological history is scattered among picturesque villages and can be experienced up close in the rocks of Bradgate Park and Beacon Hill. Such is the importance of Charnwood Forest, it is now an aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. At the heart of this dramatic landscape is the dynamic university and market town of Loughborough, home to the last major bell foundry in the UK, 800-year-old markets and the Great Central Heritage Railway. In Charnwood, we are proud of our past and excited for our future. Our award-winning Loughborough University and cutting-edge science and enterprise parks are leading world-class research, innovation and sport, and nurturing the stars and heroes of future generations. Discover Charnwood, a fascinating destination promising a non-stop voyage from ancient origins to future potential. In Charnwood, we are shaping tomorrow's world today. Shaping tomorrow's world today. That's what we do here in Charmwood Borough Council. We also have two other councils here. Um, and I think, Anna, are you with us in Sweden? Yes, now I'm with you. Can you hear me? I can hear Perfect. you loud and clear. <laughs> and what a change I, in I, surroundings. I, I... Yes, I did. And I took out my headset, my Bluetooth headset, as we walked here, because I didn't want to lose any, any of the earpieces here. And then the phone disconnected from the Bluetooth headset, and uh, it took some time before I could find the settings to connect it again. But I'm glad that you can hear me and that we're back live with you again. Yes, as you can see, we've changed the uh, surroundings here. We walked not more than five, ten minutes from the spot where we were just... Uh, just a little while ago, further up here. But what we see behind me here is actually traces from the very rich industrial history that we have here on this site. For over a century, from about uh, mid-1900s till the uh, 1950s, this area was a big industrial site. And we had over 100 people employed working with uh, with ex extraction of geological materials in this area. Now, uh, nowadays, this is pretty much a forgotten history and we just see the traces out in nature, out in the landscape, like we do behind me here. And this place was kind of uh, ideal if you wanted to have an industry. We had both the water coming down from the water pole that we saw previously that was very good if you wanted to have uh, to drive a mill. But we also have a lot of geological mat material that were easily extracted, especially from the alum shale. Because what you did here in the industries here was uh, basically, or most importantly, you extracted alum uh, and you also had a burning of lime here. Uh, but the bay alum, they, it was that they extracted here from the alum shale, it was crushed and then used as a chemical salt mostly for, uh, for paper making later on. And they were, uh, had this business of alum extraction here all the way up till the 1950s. But what we see behind me here is actually a lime kiln. So this was used for the burning of lime. And I know that you have that all over, the, all over England too and many other places around the world. But this tradition of burning lime is a very, very strong tradition in uh, our geopark. 
And uh, they used these uh, Urstenar, as I talked about earlier, these stink stones that you find in the alum shales, uh, most importantly. And they also found out that the alum shale uh, itself, it contained a lot of uh, organic material and oil. So you could use the alum shale as fuel when you wanted to burn the lime. Because uh, 150 years ago, we did not have these big forests around here. We had a lot of people living here and all of them wanted to use the forest, use the wood to, to keep their houses warm. So we barely had any forest around the mountains. So that was a scarce resource. So when they found out that they could use the rocks on the mountains, both the lime, that was a very important resource, but then also the alum shale to burn the lime, that was a very important step in the industrial history of our area. So what they did is that they built these type of lime kilns, kilns as you can see behind me, and they stacked alum shale and lime on top of each other in different layers. And then they started to burn uh, the lime in there. And depending on the size of the lime kiln, this process could take a few days up to a week or even more before the lime had burned. And uh, I am not a, uh, a chemist, but I know that you need to burn the lime to be able to extract or produce the calcium oxide that we humans need if you want to use the lime then or the calcium, for example, when you, uh, when you produce cement or, or other type of, uh, of materials. So I think that what we have behind me here, the lime kill, is kind of proof of how the geodiversity in our geopark on the mountains and in this region also uh, was or and still is very, very important for humans and for human history. Because we humans are dependent on geological materials still today. But this important uh, industrial history that we have in our region is, took place only because we had a great uh, geodiversity here on the Table Mountains with the different, uh, different layers of bedrocks. Thank you so much for not only one, but two spectacular geosites that tell your fantastic geopark story so well and relate to people all around the world. And I'm hoping we've got some friends on from Yorkshire who can really relate to the similar geology that's found there and the way it's shaped their communities as well. Because Geodiversity Day is an opportunity to realize how these non-living elements of nature really do shape our society and our lives. So just in the last few minutes with uh, our friends in Sweden, we've seen two fantastic sites here with you, Anna, today. Just give us a little flavor. What why else should people come and see your geoparks? What else have you got on offer in the, uh, and tell me if I'm saying it wrong, by the way, I think is it Plateau Berghines, is that correct? Plateau Berghines. Berghines, Plateau Berghines. Yeah, but I, I don't know, I've probably pronounced a lot of, of English words, words wrong here. That, that's what happens when you're on a live broadcast across the globe. But uh, you're welcome to come and visit here on your uh, on your own, Jack, and we can we can work with a Swedish pronunciation there, so you can you can get some time to practice. But I think that why people should visit our area here is that it is quite uh, it is definitely because of the great variation in nature that we have here. We have the 15 table mountains themselves, but in between the table mountains, we also have a quite a spectacular landscape that I haven't really talked about today, but that is the proof of the last ice age, where we have a many, many diversities, uh, diversity of, of landforms that were shaped or formed by the last ice age. Uh, so both the table mountains themselves and then the, uh, then the uh, landscape in between the mountains creates a region where we have uh, a lot of variety, both in natural landscapes and but also in cultural landscapes. And we're situated in West Sweden, just a little bit north of Gothenburg, which is Sweden's second largest city. And we're actually situated, for those that are a little familiar with Swedish geography, 
or it's situated between Sweden's two largest lakes, Vänern and Vettel. And that's kind of how you can locate us on, uh, on, the, on the map. So you're very warm welcome, both you, Jack, and everyone else who's uh, watching here to come visit us in Sweden. You can find more information, of course, at our website uh, at platavergensgeopark.se. Uh, and you can also follow us on Facebook or other social media where you find more information about the geology of the area and the work we do. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much once again to Anna and all the team at the Geopark there in Sweden. We're really grateful for your time and showing some of the spectacular geodiversity and connecting it with why it's so important to our society and how our communities have been shaped. So thanks once again. We will uh, leave you there and wish you a lovely week, a lovely, uh, uh, a happy International Geodiversity Day, the first day we've ever got to uh, say that to people before. But thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Have a great day. Wonderful. Well, we have many more people going to join us from all around the world. Hopefully, if uh, internet connections allow, we'll be joining friends from Chile in the in South America. We're going to be coming over to Europe to speak to a friend in Hungary, hopefully soon, and also going all the way to the other, once again, back down to the Southern Hemisphere, where we're hoping to meet a great friend and geodiversity speaker from South Africa. Uh, and then the, in the final moments of today's broadcast, we're going to be joined by Her Excellency Laura Davis, who is the UK Ambassador and Permanent Representative to UNESCO to speak to us live from UNESCO HQ to tell us why is geodiversity important to UNESCO and why should geodiversity be of significance and increasing significance to um, people within the policy space. Now, if the past, we're getting up to an hour, hasn't uh, converted why geodiversity is of significance, then maybe you'll listen to this next video, which was brilliantly narrated by Professor Ian Stewart, who's a geologist and broadcaster. You may have seen him on the BBC before presenting many programs about geology and the geosciences. And we were very lucky to get his support for producing this video, which was key to spreading the word about why geodiversity is so important. So let's share that video now. Men will be taught that beneath and behind all the outward beauty of our lowlands, our uplands and our highlands, there lies an inner history which, when revealed, will give beauty a fuller significance and an added charm. Archibald Geeky, Landscape and Literature, 1905. Our planet is such a special place, enlivened by an incredible ecological richness of fauna and flora. But the accelerating loss of natural habitat and species mean that biodiversity is on everyone's lips. And yet, underpinning biodiversity is its hidden silent partner, geodiversity. The basis of every ecosystem are the non-living elements of nature, rocks, minerals and soils, and landforms and topography mountains, gorges, rivers and lakes. This geodiversity has its own intrinsic value worthy of protection. And it has an essential role for the human planet It provides the building stones for our towns and cities. And it provides the material for our energy resources, including renewable energy. So as well as underpinning biodiversity, geodiversity underpins human diversity. 
It's the bedrock of our national and cultural identity. The foundations of Mother Earth. Our common home. was Professor Ian Stewart and you can find more on that video and you can find it with uh, subtitles in many many different languages on the Geodiversity Day website geodiversityday.org. Now hopefully I'm not sure we've been having some connection issues but hopefully we're going to be joined very shortly in the next few minutes by Geo very appropriately named, who is joining us from the Discovery UNESCO Global Geopark in Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. You can see there that dot on the right-hand side, that most eastern province in Canada. Now, it's very special to us because it's our sister ship uh, Geopark. We are sisters with them. I'm not going to spoil the fun for the wonderful rocks uh, that Geo can tell us. Um, so if we uh, take away that wonderful map, Geo, can you hear us? Hi, I can hear you. Can you see me and hear me? We can see you. We can hear you. Geo is a PhD student at Memorial University of Newfoundland, where he studies some of the most ancient animal fossils and most uh, early large complex life in the world. It's one of the reasons we have a sistership agreement between here in Charmwood Forest and where Geo is now, because while it's thousands of miles away now on the other side of the Atlantic, um, 565 million years ago, these rocks would have been very close together. So Geo, do you want to quickly introduce us? Where are you at the moment? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, thank you, Jack, for the introduction. And uh, yes, as uh, Jack just said, uh, we had a lot of ties uh, with uh, your own uh, geopark in Charwood Forest because uh, the rocks here where I'm standing on, I'll give you a quick look around. You see, they are uh, amazing uh, uh, sedimentary rocks, uh, mostly silstone, and uh, they are recording the environments uh, of the Idiacaran, uh, the period before the Cambrian where the animals uh, did not quite evolve yet. And uh, in those rocks, we can find uh, some amazing uh, fossils that we don't really know what they are since they are uh, so old. And uh, they present uh, some uh, uh, very uh, interesting and complex body plans, but we cannot really assign them to any, uh, any specific uh, group of uh, extant living uh, organisms. So we're trying to uh, understand that. And uh, yeah, besides the fossil uh, in this particular geopark, the Discovery Geopark, which is uh, uh, a very recent park, it was instituted only two years ago uh, as a UNESCO park. We don't uh, only have fossils, but also a variety of uh, uh, extremely scenographic uh, uh, landscapes uh, with sea arches uh, and uh, huge folds in the rocks uh, and amazing colors. Because the, uh, the Bonavista Peninsula, records uh, uh, rocks uh, that were deposited in a lot of different environments uh, uh, during the Diakaran. So we have uh, uh, deep water uh, rocks that will preserve the fossils, but also uh, rocks uh, where uh, uh, important minerals can be found and uh, with spectacular colors. So maybe I'll just give you a look around on the surface uh, and uh, show you what we are doing. Uh, yes, you thank, you, thank you, Geo. Yeah. We're, what I'm going to do, Geo is on a wonderful surface, sometimes called Hoffman 14 or the Johnson yep. surface. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to jump out of the screen and Geo, if you can take us for a few minutes on a little tour, show us some of the wonderful fossils, what they are, what their name is and why they're so special. And then I'll, I'll pop up, but we, we're going to give you all the screen. Yep. Well, uh, I lost you, Jack, <laughs> so I guess uh, I'm good to go. Uh, so you can see my colleagues over there. 
there is Duncan, Rod, and Ailey. And uh, what they are doing is uh, preparing uh, silicon casts. Uh, they are uh, looking at those fossils on the rocks. And uh, what they do is take some plasticine, uh, make a wall, and pour the silicon all over so we can uh, uh, get the fossils uh, back to the lab and study them without ruining the rock. Um, I can find some fossils to show you. Uh, unfortunately, the light is not great. Uh, mm. If I get close, yeah, you should be able to see it. If you see this, this structure here, which in this case has some silicon from somebody else that didn't clean it properly. Uh, but uh, this is uh, a species called uh, Fractofusus. And it is one of those uh, rangiomorphs organisms that we don't really understand uh, uh, what, what kind of uh, organisms they were. Uh, they have this very particular uh, uh, fractal branching. You see, they look like uh, they have uh, some first order branches going these directions and those first, first order branches are further subdivided in smaller order branches so uh, that must certainly have some kind of biological function and uh, we are trying to understand if maybe uh, these fractal morphologies uh, uh, were uh, somehow tied uh, to uh, those organisms trying to having uh, symbiotic relationships uh, with the microorganisms that were living uh, uh, on the seafloor, because you have to think that during the Ediacaran there were uh, no animals uh, moving around on the seafloor, so there was no disturbance, and this allowed uh, uh, the microbes and bacteria to colonize the uh, entire surfaces and produce very thick layers of uh, mat ground on which those organisms were feeding. Uh, I can find some other uh, fossils on this surface. Uh, there's really just uh, a lot of Fractofusus. <laughs> Uh, wherever you look, you'll see hundreds of them of very different shapes and sizes. So a lot of our work is also trying to reconstruct uh, uh, what the population uh, were like, uh, how many generations were in a population, and if those organisms were somehow aligned with the current or not. Uh, so there's also another species on the surface. Oh, thank you, Duncan. He just gave me a piece of plasticine to show you. What we can do, just press the plasticine in the, on the surface and we can get a, a positive uh, impression of the, of the fossil where we can uh, look at the details. Yeah, the light is not great, but I guess you can see some of the fractal branching here. Um, see any black brookia? This one uh, is a kind of an ugly one. I'm looking for a better one. But uh, this is the other species that dominates the surface. And it's this kind of a big structure, uh, a bit undefined. But we found some places where they seem to have like little pores uh, on them. So it was uh, hypothesized that those organisms were in fact uh, uh, animals uh, and uh, they were sponges. So uh, we know that uh, there were some animals uh, in the Idiacaran and in this park as well. We um, Jack was involved uh, in the discovery of what is the oldest animal ever found, Autia quadriformis, which is a, a cnidarian, so something like a jellyfish. So we have evidence for some animals being here, but clearly uh, there was not a lot of movement. What was here was pretty much set in place and uh, not moving around a lot. So uh, whenever we have a surface like this, and uh, you can see how messy it is, uh, it's like for football fields altogether, uh, we can really have a kind of a snapshot of what the seafloor looked like 560 million years ago. So I think it's it's very interesting. Um, I don't know, Jack. Do you have any questions? Want to get back to something in particular? Thank you so much, Geo, for showing us those wonderful fossils, the Johnson surface there. And of course, if anyone watching uh, wishes to visit those, um, do go on to the Discovery Glo Glo UNESCO Global Geopark uh, website where you can find out more details, not only about the site that Geo's at at the moment, but many of the sites in that geopark that stretches from Trinity in the southeast to Tickle Cove in the northwest. There's so much to see there. And we're going to show you a little video in a moment to where you can learn uh, more. But Geo, do you want to tell us a little bit about what were the environments that these early organisms uh, were living in? 
Yeah, so as I said, uh, in this case, uh, we're looking at rocks that were deposited in a, probably a kind of a deep uh, marine environment, uh, most certainly below 200 meters in depth on a, what would be uh, pretty much an abyssal plain. So uh, uh, that was an environment that was uh, really stable uh, for uh, long periods of time. Nothing would happen, but it would also be affected by... Uh, dramatic events periodically that will deposit like turbidites on top of those organisms and it was also um, a very active uh, volcanic area so every now and then there will be volcanic eruptions uh, that will put uh, a lot of ash in the air and this ash will fall down on the on the water and uh, slowly deposit on the bottom of the ocean bearing those organisms so those organisms were most likely uh, not doing much for pretty much their own life and get buried at some point. So they were probably trying to uh, live in this environment where they would have to gather all of the nutrients and all of the carbon they needed to survive by staying in a single place where uh, not much material would get there. And they would also have to deal with uh, uh, some conditions that would be changing periodically. So they might have had to need to have uh, reproductive strategies that would allow them to escape uh, those uh, periods of burial, for example. So we're trying to uh, understand uh, what really they were doing, because uh, since we don't have anything similar anymore in, uh, uh, in the extant uh, living organisms, uh, there's no real comparison and uh, everything we do uh, has some kind of speculation behind it. And we're trying to just uh, compare uh, what we see in the rocks and what we see in the fossils and uh, try to reconstruct those environments. But certainly they were very, very different from anything you will find on Earth now. So, yeah. And, and, and Gio, a, a, a final question. Uh, because I know from being out there myself that these are spectacular sites and you want to spend as much time looking at the fossils as possible. Yeah. But one final question, this is of course International Geodiversity Day and we want to understand not only the wonderful geodiversity out there but explain to people why it's so important. So to someone who's not a paleontologist, can you tell us why is it so important to better understand these 565 million year old fossils from the discovery unesco global geopark uh, because uh that is uh when uh life uh, as we know it started so uh, really uh this is the first time in the history of earth uh, where we find something uh, that looked like uh, something more than a single cell uh, floating in the ocean uh, those are the first organisms that uh, first uh, colonize the seafloors first produce uh, big bodies uh, some of them can get very big some of those fossils can get up to two meters in length so um it it, it has a lot of ties to pretty much everything we have now it's kind of like studying history you know we find out uh, what happened uh, that led us here and uh, what might happen in the future as well because uh, this also allows us to study how the planet changed and uh, how animals and uh, other organisms reacted to those changes during time because the conditions were dramatically different and they could always change especially if we're not careful so uh, i think uh, it's really important to understand the history of earth uh, in all of its complexity and uh, places like this are really, really interesting because they are really the first chapter in the book for uh, uh, for what we know about uh, biology and uh, geology as well. And uh, in general, uh, I mean, this geopark is really nice. It's just a very nice place where to spend time. And besides the fossils, there's also a lot of uh, extremely cool sceneries where uh, it's just a nice place to look at. So uh, the, the title of uh, uh, UNESCO Global Site is certainly deserved, both for its scientific importance, but also for the more uh, touristic uh, uh, side of it. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Gio, for spending some time with us today on International Geodiversity Day. It's always good to link together the Charmwood Forest and the Discovery Geoparks. And please do pass on our warmest regards to all the team at the Geopark and also to Professor Duncan McIlroy and the team there. Um, we wish we could be there with you. Um, so thank you so much once more to, uh, to Gio and all the team. Yeah, thank you, Jack. And uh... Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, thank you so much. Right, um, with that, we are going to just have a quick taster because we were very lucky there to have Geo taking us to one of the most important fossil surfaces there, around about 560 million years old from a geological period known as the Ediacaran, almost exactly the same age as the rocks I'm sitting here on in Charmwood Forest Geopark, Bragate Park, thousands of miles away. But there's so much more to UNESCO Global Geopark than just those fossils. And we've got a lovely video that we're going to watch now that explains. The Discovery UNESCO Global Geopark on the Bonavista Peninsula is a 280 kilometer long celebration of how geology can shape our communities and culture. With so much to see and do, you can devote an entire trip to experience it all. The Rock. The Big Land. Newfoundland and Labrador is home to some of the greatest geological discoveries on the planet. Follow along as we journey across these legendary coasts, unearthing stories millions of years in the making. Seven communities within the geopark, you can find remarkable geological stories that will take you back half a billion years. Like the tale of ancient rivers that form stunning multicolored rock layers. Or a community of fossilized families that lived long ago. You can even uncover the legend of Heutia, one of the first animals that ever flexed its muscles. This geopark has so many stories to tell. It's like a real life choose your own adventure. No matter where you visit along this coast, the next chapter will always begin right beneath your feet. So there you go. Oh, look, the sun has come out. It's almost blinding me. Wonderful weather here today at Charmwood Forest Geopark as we join you again for International Geodiversity Day and this Geodiversity Live, a live stream connecting us with people all around the world to celebrate geodiversity and its great importance to us in society and communities uh, across the world. A reminder that if you've got any questions or indeed you just want to tell us where you are in the world, we'd love to hear that. Put that in the chat on Facebook or YouTube. We love to hear where you're joining us from today. Now, I'm hoping in a moment we can go over to Hungary, to the area of Hungary, just to the west of Miskolc, which is the second city. I don't think we're quite ready at the moment. Now, you can see the Buk Videk Geopark, which is an aspiring geopark uh, in Hungary. I'm not sure we're quite ready to go to Hungary um, at the moment. So we'll, we'll lose the map and I shall talk about some fossils. I shall also say I can see some lovely comments. We've got Anne Irving in, who's as ever joining us uh, from Woodhouse. Woodhouse? 
as it happens, it's just a few miles over there. Hello, and it's always a pleasure to have you joining us. And I can see that uh, Peter Egonsson was joining us earlier on from Sweden, watching along to Anna, who joined us from the geopark there. Now, um, every geopark, we haven't talked about what a geopark is yet, and maybe a bit later we'll play you a little video that explains that. But first, we're going to tell you about why we are trying to become a UNESCO Global Geopark. You have to do many, many things to become a UNESCO Global Geopark, but one very important thing that you have to show is that you have internationally significant geology. And for us, that is our amazing fossils. And I've already told you a little bit about a few of them already, but we were very pleased that even though the discoveries of the fossils around here go back to 1956, 1957, when two school boy and a school girl found the same fossil separately. Now we know that fossil as Charnia Masonia, a fossil that changed our understanding of evolution and created a kind of gold rush to go and explore for fossils in these very ancient rocks that we now know as being from the Ediacaran age. Well, New discoveries continue to be made in places like this at Charmwood Forest Geopark. And we were very pleased earlier this year that a team led by Dr. Frankie Dunn, she's a researcher based out of the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. They described, their, the team there described a brand new fossil that well, it just blew our mind. It's quite different from the normal types of fossils um, we get here. And it made a bit of a splash on the, in the international press and very useful for us because it shows that this is internationally significant geology. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to play you a video that was from the BBC East Midlands with an interview containing one of the authors who speaks to the correspondent. Tell you a little bit more about this amazing fossil. Now, a fossil found in rock in Charmwood Forest in Leicestershire could be evidence of one of the earliest predators that ever lived 560 million years ago. Paleontologists say it pushes back their understanding of modern animal groups like jellyfish by 20 million years, as Victoria Hicks reports. 560 million years ago, Charmwood Forest sat at the bottom of a deep ocean on the sides of a series of volcanoes. And it's here where this earliest known animal predator would have lived. How significant is this find? Well, the early history of animal life is very poorly understood, and that's mostly because there are very few fossils preserved at that time. This fossil pushes back one of the modern groups of animals by 20 million years further back into time. And that's the group that included the sea anemones, uh, the jellyfish and the corals. It's understood this specimen lived in shallower water than other fossils found here. It's different from anything else found around the world because it has a skeleton with densely packed tentacles. So we know that the animal had a stalk and a cup and on top of that or within that cup um, was a polyp very much like a sea anemone with lots and lots of tentacles that it used to catch food. This fossil has been named Aurora Lumini Attenborough after Sir David Attenborough, who used to hunt for fossils here as a child in Charmwood Forest. Interestingly though, he said he never went looking for fossils in the rocks where this one was found because they were considered so ancient they dated from before life began on this planet. That all changed in 1957, when a schoolboy found this fern-like impression. It turned out to be one of the oldest fossilised animals, Charnia masoni, further establishing Charnwood Forest as a world-class site for paleontologists. For the first time, we're able to say at 560 million years ago, there was a group of animals that looked just like modern animals, that had skeletons, that were predators and that were colonial. There were lots of them living together. That's a really, really big thing. Victoria Hicks, BBC East Midlands Today, Charmwood. There you go, everyone. Joining us all around the world, there was uh, Aurora Lumina Attenborough, one of the oldest animal predators ever found. And it was found just a few miles from where we're standing now, broadcasting live from Bragate Park in Charmwood. 
Onward Forest Geopark. Um, but we're hoping that we're now going to go live to the Buch Videk Geopark in Hungary, just to the west of Hungary's second city, Miskolc. Um, now, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if, if it's a Jóestét or a Jónapot. Uh, my Hungarian's a little ropey, but um, Balac, how are you? Can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you loud and clearly. Can you guys hear me as well? We can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic. So to start off with, uh, Balac, tell us, tell us who you are and uh, what you do at the Buchvidek Geopark. Sure, I can do that. Uh, so, uh, my name is Balázs Megyeri. Uh, I'm the geopark manager for the Bükvidé Geopark, or in English, the Büc Region Geopark. Uh, this is an aspiring geopark um, located in the north uh, eastern side of Hungary, as uh, Jack said. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will get a green card uh, to the UNESCO Global Geopark Network by 2024. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. And what I'm going to do is um, what I'd like you to do, just you've got some wonderful sights behind you there. I can see on the screen. Just take a few minutes. I'll, when I finish the question, I'll hop off the screen so we can see where you are in all your glory. But tell us mm -hmm. um, where you are in, in, in your geopark and what geodiversity you can see there and why it's so important. Take a few minutes to guide us through this fantastic site you're joining us from today. Okay, uh, so uh, we are here in Eger Salok. Uh, this is uh, a small little village uh, next to Eger. Um, this, uh, this place is just uh, north to the village. Uh, it's called uh, a cave town or a cave dwelling town. Uh, basically, uh, behind me, you can see all these carved out houses. Uh, these are uh, so basically, the place where we are is the Buk area. Uh, this is uh, the southern parts of the Buk Mountains. Uh, this place is, uh, is uh, characterized by uh, Miocenic uh, volcanic eruptions. Um, and uh, basically, we have a lot of rhyolite tuff as a result of it, uh, approximately 17 to 21 million years old. Uh, this uh, rhyolite tuff that is uh, quite whitish is really easily carved. Uh, so people uh, from basically more than a thousand years uh, from now, uh, before us, uh, uh, they uh, started uh, carving uh, niches into uh, these uh, types of stones. Uh, at first, these were for um, different um, uh, sacrificial um, things to do, uh, but later on they started adopt uh, adopting it uh, as uh, houses or uh, shelters for animals, and basically this is one of these sites. Uh, the book Aya stone culture, which uh, encompasses all these uh, stone masonry and everything people did uh, in old times uh, with these rhyolite tuff, um, uh, can be described with uh, with uh, uh, the Koptar Kovac, uh, these are the small niches I told you about. Then there are uh, the uh, cave dwellings, there are the cave carvings, and also uh, there are these houses just like this. So basically this site uh, is one of 18 that uh, remains, and this is one of the best looking ones. Uh, right now it's um, a small museum uh, to show uh, how people lived in, in the old times. Uh, this place was usually uh, a place where uh, people uh, with less money lived. Uh, so they carved these big holes into the rock uh, and they lived there together uh, with their animals, uh, preferably uh, sheep and, um, and other uh, more expensive animals were closer to you and uh, pigs and these sort of things were uh, a bit further away in one of the other dwellings. Um, here uh, we have uh, a couple rooms showing these, uh, all of these things off. Uh, so for example, the one you see the door right there uh, is a kitchen uh, and next to it uh, on the other side of, uh, just on the side of this. So if I move it a little bit, yes, uh, that room uh, leads to uh, a bigger house uh, uh, with, um, uh, with a common room and with, um, a bedroom as well. Uh, so 
in, in a really natural, uh, this is uh, a place where people lived until the 1960s. Uh, and uh, uh, the stone material carved out of these dwellings were also used uh, to build houses uh, down in the village as well. So in a nutshell, this is the place. <laughs> Kusanum Sivashen, uh, Kusanum Sapen, sorry. Uh, what a wonderful tour there, and a wonderful example of how geodiversity is not just for resources like the wonderful Mount Sorrow Quarry uh, behind me here, but people are literally building their communities into the geodiversity. And uh, out of, I love that, rhyolitic tough so that's uh, tell us a bit more about what the environments did you say they were from the miocene what, what were the environments like there and how many years ago is that in million millions of years ago what would uh, what would life have been like in hungary at that time aha uh -huh. okay so um basically uh, uh this place uh, around the miocene was uh, an ocean uh, and uh, so most of the stones and most of uh, the geology that we have from that time is uh, is limestones and uh, and all sedimentary rocks. Uh, but there was a big volcano to the northwest uh, that had a big, huge eruption. And uh, basically, uh, this eruption uh, got a lot of... Uh, uh, volcanic material into the air and it traveled a long time uh, to the place where we are currently uh, and it bonded uh, here and formed uh, this rhyolite tough uh, area and so uh, if you uh, look at the geological map of uh, the book uh, basically uh, uh, you can see all of it is is mostly limestone uh, different limestone materials uh, but the uh, southern side it's like a color uh, with uh, this uh, this rhyolite tough layer on top of it. Absolutely fantastic. And while we've got you with us, tell us, because of course this is a very important area in Hungary uh, historically too. You've got many great uh, elements of cultural heritage within your geopark. Do you want to give us a few moments, tell us about some of the wonderful cultural heritage that you have in the Buch region geopark as well? Okay, uh, then I will start with the earliest examples. So we have uh, four prehistoric caves. Uh, all of them are really important. Uh, in one of them, uh, they found Neanderthal people, uh, the remains of Neanderthal people, uh, which is uh, was a huge discovery because before that, uh, the people uh, or scientists uh, thought that uh, the Neanderthal people didn't come uh, this much to the east. Uh, and this was a new discovery uh, that they lived in the Carpathian Basin as well. Uh, then we have also another cave called the Selata Cave, uh, where um, remains and tools of another culture uh, uh, were found. And it was the first time uh, it was found. So uh, it was also the name giver of that culture, named the Selata culture. Uh, it's, uh, it's already a Homo sapiens uh, as well. It's... Um, around, uh, if I remember correctly, it's like 12,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, then if we move uh, a long time uh, forward in the timeline, uh, the next one would be uh, the Beehive Stones or Koptakövek, uh, which I already told you about, these small niches, the first example of stone carving in the region. Uh, then here in the Buk region, Geopark, uh, we have also a lot of hill forts and uh, old uh, for, uh, settle uh, fortifications. Um, basically during uh, the 1200s uh, up till the 1600s, and even before that some, uh, in some cases, uh, these hilly regions uh, provided uh, a lot of opportunity to build different fortifications on top of hills. So uh, the villages close by could be uh, protected well. Uh, and also we are next to Eger. Uh, Eger is, uh, is hugely important in Hungary. This was the first place, the first uh, castle that could withhold the Ottoman invasion in uh, 1552. Before that, uh, every single uh, Hungarian castle fell and uh, the Hungarian defenders here 
2,000 defenders against 20,000 uh, Ottomans managed to hold off uh, and uh, remain in the castle. And so uh, basically uh, they denied Ottomans to go up, or, uh, up north uh, at that time. What a fantastic geopark you have there in Hungary. Um, we are, we're very jealous, especially with places uh, like <laughs> Eger. Well worth a visit to these places. And, and everything we have just heard is a wonderful example about how these places aren't just important for their geodiversity, but they're important for their cultural and their biodiversity too. And really, that all comes back to the geodiversity as well. We can't build things if we haven't got the rocks to make them out of. And maybe we'll show you a little of our cultural heritage here in Charmwood Forest in a few moments. But at that point, I'm gonna thank uh, Balatz and all the team at the Buch region uh, Geopark there. Wish you well in your UNESCO application. And you are always, as is everyone, welcome at the Charmwood Forest Geopark anytime. Thank you for joining us today for Geodiversity Live. Thank you so much for the opportunity <laughs> uh, and hope to see you soon in person. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Wie sind Wiesundlatashra, indeed. Right at this point, we are going to, we're hoping that at some point we're going to have uh, some of our uh, friends joining us around the world having a few uh, connection issues. We're hoping we're going to be joined at some point uh, by some friends from Santiago in Chile. And we're also hoping to hear a talk um, from South Africa about some of the amazing and really genuinely staggering geological heritage that is in South Africa. I can see we've been also joined by Tristan Fendel. Thank you very much for joining us today, Tristel, who's joining us from the Kishkunsag National Park in Hungary. Uh, a Yonapot to you too. Thank you for joining us to all around the world. And if you've got any comments or questions, uh, or you just want to let us know where you're joining us from, do put that in the comments comments on YouTube or Facebook, and we will see that uh, coming through. But next, what I'm going to do before I show you a little bit more uh, of the fantastic views we have here in Brygate Park, um, I want to play you a wonderful little video that's been made um, by the Polish government. International Geodiversity Day was instigated after the Oxford Geoheritage Virtual Conference. Um, when the delegates came together, 600 people from 60 different countries came together um, to say that we needed this to raise the profile of geodiversity in public discourse and, of course, policy discussions as well. And we were very lucky that the governments of the United Kingdom, Portugal and Poland came together to put this on the agenda um, at UNESCO. And just in the past 24 hours, the Polish government have released a wonderful video celebrating their involvement in International Geodiversity Day and the fantastic geodiversity of Poland. So before I show you around Bragate Park, let's see that video now. Dear Grandma, this morning I received your letter. I do not have all the answers yet, but I think I know where to start looking. Yours truly, Frankie. Do you ever stop to wonder where the rocks you stand on come from? You sent me to search for a place where the water captured the rainbow. I didn't think it was real. From here, I must find the kingdom of forgotten fire. Remember, look too closely at the trees and you might not see the forest. Look for slumbering giants that hide in plain sight. Two worlds colliding. Seeing backwards through layers of time. As you begin to look at the world with new eyes, you will start to find details that will amaze you.
You told me about a place where all roads must end. A place where I couldn't go any further. I think I found it. Thank you, Grandma. there i've changed the view i've rotated us around so that you can see some of the fantastic rocks we have here because but in the book region geopark was telling us all about volcanic ash and although these are sediments we too in charmwood forest had a volcano here erupting maybe somewhere five or six miles that way erupting into the ocean the ash was coming down and some of these layers that you might be able to see in these 560 million year old rocks here in Bragate Park in Leicestershire there's a little bit of volcanic ash in these and when we slice them up very thin you can see that there's little pieces of volcanic glass in there you might also be able to see on the left hand side if you look very very closely and you've got a very large screen you might be able to see Leicester we are right next to some really big population centers here some absolutely exceptional countryside we have here in Charmwood Forest but just a few miles that way we have the great university town and market town of Loughborough Leicester one of England's big big cities is just there and standing up on the hill here you get a great view over to the big city there and then up on the other side of the geopark, which we can't show you from this geosite, there's a string of towns and villages with a great coal mining history. And indeed, that industry lends its name to the most prominent of those, Coalville. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to, we're going to have a little uh, look behind the scenes now, live. As everyone say hello to Helen, who's helping us, one of our very, in, in many ways, the most important person in the Geopark team, because she keeps us all planned out and on time and all of that. Um, and you can see all the technical gubbins now behind the scenes. But most importantly, if I stand there, you can see Old John Tower, which is really the most prominent landmark in all of the great Shire County of Leicestershire um, here in Bradgate Park. And we're very proud that even though we only have 8% of the area of Leicestershire, we have got the best sites. And one of them is Bradgate Park here, which is an ancient deer park. And indeed, when you come for a walk around the hills here in Bradgate Park, you'll see many of the deer here and you can come up see these ancient rocks which within them contain fossils 560 million years old that tell us the story of where we as fellow animals came from and you can see spectacular things like old john tower which was uh, i think i've got it right and i'm sure the historians in the chat will correct me if i'm wrong it was essentially a place to go up to the top and watch the, the hunt, the deer hunt going on in, in days gone by. Now, where we are here, I can't show you a direct view, but there's also the ruins of the old Bragate house, which was the house of the Gray family. Royal connection there because, of course, Lady Jane Grey, the short-lived uh, Queen of England, she, uh, that is the same family. So a real connection here to not only what was going on in Leicestershire and not only what's going on in the world geologically, but so many connections to wider Britain and the world um, as well. Now, in a moment, I'm hoping we're going to go to our friends in South Africa, um, where I'm hoping Cecilia's going to uh, join us. And I'm going to ask her if she can just pop her uh, camera on. Wonderful. So what I'm going to do is um, let's call up Cecilia and say hello. How are you? Hi. Uh, how are you? <laughs> fantastic. I can hear you uh, loud and clear. It's fantastic to have you joining us here today. Um, I think you are going to share 
with us a little talk about some of the fantastic uh, geodiversity in your area. While I talk a little bit more, can I suggest that you click uh, the present button at the bottom of the screen, uh, Cecilia, and that will allow you to upload your slides uh, onto the system. Um, while okay. that is happening, um, we, I will just remind you that if you've got any questions or comments, do pop those into the chat, either on uh, Facebook or on YouTube. We know we have viewers on Twitter as well. If you comment on there, um, we'll have to get back to you a little bit later. I think Cecilia is uh, uploading a few slides. Cecilia? Yes, I, I am. I'm not sure if you can see my slide presentation now. It's probably oh, it's uploading. just, yeah, it's uploading, not a problem. While that's uploading, Cecilia, do you want to tell us a little bit about where you're joining us from today? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jack. I am joining from South Africa uh, in Bulukwane City in the northern part of South Africa. I am a geoscientist from the Council for Geoscience, uh, formerly known as the Geological Survey of South Africa. So we are very excited that we finally, the, the day has arrived, we're celebrating the first International Geodiversity Day today. So we are very excited to be part of this. Absolutely fantastic. Right, at this point, we're going to pop your um, slides up and I am going to disappear so that you get... Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we are very excited to be part of this initiative, uh, celebrating International Geodiversity Day here in South Africa. Uh, uh, the, the, the geology of, the South, of South Africa, uh, South Africa has a very rich and diverse geological history, which spans some 4 billion years old and with rocks uh, found on and around the Kappa Carton. We also have one of the world-renowned basins, such as the, the Vez Basin, uh, it's famously known uh, for gold deposits. And we also have one of the largest and most prolific igneous complexes in the world, uh, known as the Bushveld Complex. And additionally, you know, South Africa it has uh, mineral commodities such as uh, platinum group metals, gold, and, and, and coal. They, they drive the economy of South Africa. But yet, we have very few geological sites that are conserved and, and known to the public. So we are very happy that there is now a day that is dedicated to geodiversity. And we believe that this day, going forward, will play a crucial role in promoting your diversity, your heritage uh, of our beautiful country, South Africa. What is more interesting about uh, geology here in South Africa is that the Asian human development, it, it, it's linked closely with the surrounding geology. So indigenous knowledge here in South Africa has shown to have utilized the surrounding geology for various developmental uh, applications. Uh, including some of the earlier signs of, of mineral beneficiation. And this evidence is, is uh, shown or is seen at the Mapungubia World Heritage Site, um, which is located in the northern part of South Africa and the border between Botswana and, 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 and Zimbabwe. And what else you can see there at Mapungubia is this well-renowned or famous uh, figurine of the gold rhinos indicating that the ancient human uh, uh, beings or the, the, the original peoples of, of, of this area were able to beneficiate uh, gold pre-colonial times. So it's quite an interesting place to visit. And you also have some ancient art uh, rock paintings there at Mapungu, yeah, this picture was taken there. And uh, at the bottom, you can see the Dwas River UG1 heritage site, which is part of the Bushveld complex. And this is the geological map of South Africa. 
our map is freely available on the CGS uh, data portal. So we are trying to make sure that geoscience information is available freely for, for the public. Uh, you might be wondering how are we celebrating your diversity here in South Africa while I'm, I'm sitting in the office. Uh, later this month, we will be uh, going on a field trip, uh, Tiger Evolution of the Carver Proton, uh, in celebration of the Geodiversity Day, as well as 100, 110 years of the existence of Cancer for Geoscience. So, the field trip is aimed at taking the participant on the journey from one of the oldest rocks on Earth and transitioning into the Anthropocene. So there are several key geological features which will be investigated on this field trip. And we will also take a, a participant to one of the sites that shows the earliest continental crust and, and, and the development of, of these tectonic structures and, and, and that have led to the economically important mineralizing systems. And uh, later on, on the trip, we will also take them to one of the uh, sites that your uh, Council for Geoscience is conducting uh, some uh, experience, uh, exper experiment focusing on the passive treatment site in Mpumalanga, uh, as well as the proposed uh, ca carbon capture utilization and storage, storage site in Mpumalanga. You know, as you know, you know, climate change is affecting our continent and, and globally. So the Council for Geoscience is also working towards redu reducing carbon emission, hence working on this uh, carbon capture, utilization and storage site. And finally, we will emphasize more on these um, uh, geoheritage sites that are located, are located uh, throughout uh, the country. And you can see that our map will start, our road will start from Deben, passing over to Free State, moving over to Pumalanga at the Babaton Greenstone Belt, and then coming back to Pretoria. So it will cover a, a large area uh, and it will be quite uh, educational as well for the participants. So we encourage everyone to join us and, 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 and be part of this field trip. Uh, these are the, some of the rocks that you will see uh, on this field trip, looking at the cyanide, which is about 3.1 billion years, and the, the pillow lavas there, which are about 3.3 billion years. So it will be quite an, an exciting uh, field trip. I uh, will now zoom on over to one of the provinces in South Africa, which is Limpopo province. Uh, also known as Africa's Edens because of this beautiful landscape. So this is the, the, the map, the geological map of Limpopo province. And also we have identified a number of uh, geological uh, heritage sites, which we think they are, they are worth conserving and they are worth uh, to be shared with the world. Uh, this is one of, of, of the site. This is the Waterbeck, uh, South Bansbeck, and uh, Blowback mountain ranges. As you can see there on the screen, it's quite beautiful and it's, it's good for tourism, but it's also good for, for, for geoconservation and, and, and geoheritage. What is quite interesting about this section is that it was formed between 1700 and, and 1.2 billion years ago. And they, these accessions, they fall within the period of Earth evolution when the free atmosphere oxygen was available for the first time to produce oxide of ferruginous minerals. So when you are there in the field, you can see the, the, the ferruginous minerals. And this is one of the sites where you see the blowback uh, formation uh, uh, uncomfortably overlaid by the waterback group. So we have uh, selected this site as one of those important geological site that you can visit when you go to the waterback area. I will now move off to the Lake Funduzi, which is also located in uh, Limpopo. 
Uh, this site is selected because of its geological and cultural importance. Uh, culturally, uh, this uh, area is called uh, Zuponi, which is um, in, in Jivenda language is called a secret place where the local people go there and, and, and give thanksgiving to the ancestors. However, in geologically, this uh, land, lake was formed due to a landslide that blocked the flow of, of the river. So it's quite beautiful and very pristine. And, uh, and you can see that there's not even uh, people around because the surrounding people, the villages around, they respect this area so much. So we believe that it's worth conserving and it's worth sharing this site with the, with the world. Uh, the last area that I will share with you is the PPD waterfall, which is located in the Sotansberg mountain ranges. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a, a beautiful place uh, with beautiful waterfall. And uh, geologically, this area consists of the Sibasa Basalt, and uh, you also see beautiful amygdales there on, on the basalt. Uh, culturally, still, when the people believe this area as a secret site, so it's quite uh, uh, conserved uh, by the local uh, authority. And we believe this area is worth to be a, a geoheritage site. I'll just share some of the pictures there. Uh, on the background, you can see Tate Vondo Forest. This forest is also known as a secret forest mm -hmm. where the Venda people do their uh, ancestor Thanksgiving there. And you can see a beautiful uh, uh, basalt uh, outcrop and the amygdala uh, in, 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 in the basalt uh, outcrop there. Um, last slide. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I hope that uh, you can visit South Africa and, and visit some of these sites that I've mentioned. And hopefully in the next year, you we will also participate uh, from one of these sites. And um, one thing I can also mention is that Council for Geoscience is the permanent secretariat of the Organization of African Geological Surveys. So we have also shared the information about inter, inter uh, National Geodiversity Day with our members. So we are hopeful that next year you will have more participants from other African Geological Survey in Africa. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that wonderful exposition of the fantastic, not only geodiversity, but geoheritage, the particularly special geodiversity in South Africa. And when um, I'm surrounded by rocks like this grit stone from the Cambrian from around 550 million years ago, it really pales into insignificance compared to the fantastic rocks you have from 3.3 billion years ago. I also wanted to thank you for really raising um, the issue there about climate change and how geodiversity is going to be so important to that. If we want to capture carbon and put it in the ground, those are solutions that need better understanding and harnessing of, of geodiversity. And I wanted to end with a, a question. You're involved with the uh, uh, Council for Geoscience uh, there. Um, what do you think the challenges are to getting more young people involved in geology? Because certainly in the UK, we have a bit of a problem with people thinking that a job in geology is all about oil and gas. And of course, the problems of tomorrow also need geologists. What, what do you think about the challenges and maybe the solutions for getting more young people interested in, in geodiversity and geology? Thank you so much, Jake. I think we need to communicate our science to the public in a language that they understand. And to also to say without geoscience, you know, geoscience is the foundation of life. So whatever you want to achieve for sustainable development, if you talk about the United Nations Sustainable Goals 
or the the you know the the AU 2063 version. You need knowledge based on your sites, and we provide solution. You know, we are solution driven. We deal with fundamental geoscience questions for Tetoni events and so on. But we also our other role is to make sure that we provide solution that societies experience. For example, in South Africa, there's challenges of water. And we as scientists, we, we have knowledge, we have uh, 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 techniques to find groundwater, you know. So we need to communicate to, to, to policymakers, to government, that if you use our resources, we have groundwater in South Africa. Let's explore for groundwater so that we provide society with water. And I think the youth will understand that we are quite relevant. And Geodiversity Day, it plays a huge role when we share our posts on social media. Young people are on social media, so they see our story, they're like, wow, I have rocks maybe in my village. What is this rock? Let me go to Council for Geoscience. Let me contact me war. Maybe I can want to study geology and contribute to the development of our continent and our world. And if we are transitioning to carbon, you know, you want to have clean energy, we need to find those rare earth uh, elements. How do we do that? We go and map. So we need more geologists to come together. We need more young people to get involved and know that geoscience is for everyone. And everyone is welcome to join us. And, and we move forward and we can have a beautiful country and beautiful world. Thank you. That was so beautifully put. I couldn't have put it better myself. Um, if you want to find out more about the organizations that Cecilia is involved in, or indeed the importance of raising the profile of geology and geodiversity on social media, you can do no better thing than to follow Cecilia on Twitter. You can find her tweeting away about the wonders of geodiversity. I'm particularly looking forward to hearing more about that fantastic field trip coming up next month. Um, but thank you so much for joining us live from South Africa on this October the 6th, International Geodiversity Day. We really appreciate your perspectives and sharing with us the wonders of South African geodiversity. So thanks once again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, we are nearing the end of this Geodiversity Live broadcast, coming to you live from Bradgate Park at the heart of the Charmwood Forest Geopark. Um, and we have one final guest joining us live from the HQ of UNESCO. This is a UNESCO International Geodiversity today because UNESCO is the only UN body that has responsibility for geology and the geosciences. So at this point, I'm very pleased to introduce Her Excellency Laura Davis, who is the UK ambassador and permanent representative for the United Kingdom to UNESCO, who by the looks of things is joining us live from the Sao du Papadou in UNESCO HQ. Laura, how are you? Tell us where you are and how are you having a very happy International Geodiversity Day? Hello, Jack, and I'm having an exceptionally happy International Geodiversity Day. Thank you. It's been a real thrill, actually. I've done nothing but fun things today. I have released a video about the glories of geodiversity with my Polish and Portuguese colleagues. I have been on a geodiversity walk around UNESCO. And now here I am uh, greeting you in the... Uh, special exhibition that UNESCO has put on for this first celebration of International Geodiversity Day. And the only reason that it's looking, uh, I'm not looking as if I'm about to open it, is because actually I got to open it two days ago so that um, it could be here and present for the Earth Futures Festival that UNESCO has just been, has just been running. Um, it, was, it started in New York, then it came here to Paris, and it's just on its way to Australia. 
Yes, and we should say, if you want to find out more about the Earth Futures Film Festival, all those videos which were submitted from around the world in a number of different categories, if you Google Earth Futures Film Festival, um, other search engines are available. Um, but if you find that online, you'll be able to find a fantastic website that shows you all those films, giving wonderful perspectives on geology and the geosciences. But um, Laura, I wonder if you're able to show us a little bit around the exhibition there. Give us a view of some of the different perspectives we're taking on geological diversity in this special exhibition, trying to capture the ambassadors and permanent delegates as they meet for the executive board in the next few weeks. Exactly. So I'm hoping that I'm not going to make everybody feel too seasick as I do this. Uh, but here we have a section on learning from the past, geothermal energy. Uh, we're going to pause here because this is a lovely UK one about geodiversity and our mining heritage. On to natural and cultural interactions. Uh, moving swiftly on, uh, geodiversity and human settlements. And I should say that the Earth Futures Festival focused, it had nearly 900 films from 90 countries. And the ones they showed here at UNESCO were the ones that were all about the human interaction between um, uh, landscapes and people, because that's very much at the heart of what UNESCO does. It's always putting the community and the people in the center. Then we have a little bit of biodiversity and multicolored geodiversity. Down at that end of the room, you can see all sorts of foodstuffs and uh, indigenous practices that are linked to geodiversity. Uh, sport, health. So what I think this exhibition does a really terrific job of for the non-expert audience. And let's face it, although UNESCO has a huge number of experts who work with it and to it, most of pe the people in the delegation are not geodiversity or geoscience experts, I'd include myself. And we're coming up to the absolute pièce de résistance, if I can show this. Jack, I will let you identify what this is. So that is... Charnia Mason I, which we were talking about earlier on. We're very proud that there's a little bit of Charnwood Forest in the exhibition there. It is a 500, it's a replica. The original is still here, safe, just a few miles over there in the museum in Leicester. But that is Charnia Mason I, a replica of our 560 million year old fossil that was the first conclusive Precambrian fossil ever to be discovered. So thank you for showing us that on Geodiversity Live. And if to, I'm to correct, ask you, we, we've heard, go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, what I was going to say is if I'm correct, I think the photograph behind it is actually from Discovery Geopark in Canada. Is that right? That is correct. That is from the fossil surface that Geo joined us from earlier on. That is from what's called the Johnson surface. Um, and you can see some of the fossils on that image um, that Geo showed us earlier on. And if you're good at hand recognition, you will recognize this hand as the one that's in the uh, in the photograph. Uh, so an absolutely spectacular uh, display there. And we, we thank uh, Christoph, Oslem, Catalina, and all the team at UNESCO for both helping to put together that display, but also for their support over the past two and a half years in establishing a UNESCO Geodiversity Day. Um, as we get to the final uh, few minutes, Laura, I wondered if you had some thoughts on why policymakers should be interested in geodiversity. We've heard yes. a lot from the geoscientists today, but what were, what were your thoughts on that? I do. I'm just going to start by showing you one more thing. I'm now in the main hall of, um, of the Fontenoy building at UNESCO, and I wanted to show you that what you, uh, I'm not going to tell you the rocks that I have around me because you will know, but the rule of three is being applied. There we have the igneous behind. There we have, I hope you're seeing the travertine. There we go with the Giacometti in front. And looking down briefly, we have some lovely Norwegian quartzite. So, um, and that, one of the things that I find really interesting about this explains what I'm about to say about policy, and that's that um, in the building of UNESCO, the architect strove really, really hard to um, capture rocks and art forms and uh, contributions from all around the world in order to make sure that 
because they were building the building as UNESCO was developing. So they wanted the building from the beginning to reflect the kind of organization that they wanted UNESCO to be, i.e. one where everybody can see themselves reflected, something which is all about collaboration, something which is all about building, building the defenses of peace in our minds, which is UNESCO's mandate. But um, you asked why we might be interested in geodiversity as policy makers. And um, I think essentially that comes down to the sustainable development goals. I'm sure you're all familiar with the 17 sustainable development goals that guide a lot of countries' foreign policies. The UK uh, is, is, is obviously um, one of the countries that was very closely involved in negotiating those goals at the UN. It's very, very committed to working towards implementation of them. Um, if you think of uh, COP26, for example, uh, the previous speaker was talking about climate change, um, but also if you look at uh, Sustainable Development Goal 4, um, uh, uh, Quality Education for All, that's another one which is kind of critically important both to the UK and to UNESCO. A lot of what we do is about trying to create the conditions for um, these goals to be reached. Um, and the conversations that we're starting now are unfortunately about what the successors to those goals will be as we will not have achieved those goals by 2030. But the only way we can achieve those goals um, is by um, understanding some of the science that lies behind them, the, the objective stuff that lies behind them, as opposed to the subjective politics and negotiations that I like to spout. You know, what is the hard science behind it? What are the values? What are the phenomena that will help us deliver on 2030? Geodiversity is absolutely one of those things. It lies understanding and having access to um, to the knowledge that geodiversity brings us is a prerequisite for making strides forwards on many of the SDGs. For example, every single day of the year, um, women and girls spend 220 million hours collecting clean water. Clearly, if you're spending 220 million hours collecting clean water, you're not doing lots of other things. And also it's affecting um, your ability both to uh, to fulfill your potential in all sorts of all sorts of other ways and it's geodiversity of course through its kind of ability to understand where water comes from its ability to map it that gives us the tools to unlock that so that's why um, we really want to champion geodiversity particularly at UNESCO because UNESCO as you were saying earlier is the UN organization which has the the mandate to do this it's also the organization that has um, across the UN it's the organization that's got the most geographical site designations everybody knows world heritage sites and I'm sure everybody um, in this geodiversity live is familiar with global geoparks but also um, there are the biosphere reserves there are the creative cities there are all the other geographic designations that UNESCO brings together, which act as a kind of crucible on the ground for testing out theories of how we could live more sustainably, how we can live more directly in pursuit of the Sustainable Development Goals. So that's why both why uh, geodiversity matters to British foreign policy and also why it matters to UNESCO and how UNESCO matters to the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you so much. And I think that example of how geodiversity is so important in better harnessing our water resources and how that will be of particular benefit to women and girls around the world is a brilliant example of how geodiversity is involved in all of the sustainable development goals and um, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today. We really glad and are really thankful for the effort and the the voice you've given to geodiversity alongside your colleagues from Poland and Portugal uh, as well. So thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for all that you've been doing to promote International Geodiversity Day. I think at that point we might have actually lost the connection um, with Laura, but thank you so much to Laura Davis, um, UK Ambassador and Permanent Delegate to UNESCO. And at that point we come to the end of Geodiversity Live. Um, we were, it was a real pleasure to join you for two hours with so many friends from across the world. We've been to Sweden, we've been over to Canada, we went to Hungary, we went to South Africa, and then we went live to Paris to meet uh, Laura and see the exhibition there and why this is so important to policymakers, not just 
geologists like myself. Um, I want one last plug, which is if you want to find out more about Charmwood Forest, our geopark, and the wonders that are found here, working with our friends at Charmwood Arts, we have taken over a shop at the Urban Forest, which is in Loughborough, just, just over there just a few minutes drive away and until January we're going to be open about three days a week where you can come and learn a bit more about the rocks the way those influence the biology and the culture you can meet some wonderful artists and some spectacular art photographs paintings and a brilliant sculpture trail as well we're bringing the forest to the heart of the great town of Loughborough so do please come and visit us and if you want to find out more if you find the urban forest page on the Charmwood Arts website. You can find out more about when it's open and when you can come and visit us. It's also going to be a little bit of a hub. There's going to be events and many wonderful things happening. So do go on the Charmwood Arts website to find out more. So it all it leaves me to say is thank you for everyone for joining us from all around the world today for this Geodiversity Live from Charmwood Forest Geopark. I hope you've had a very happy international geodiversity day and perhaps this time next year on october the 6th we'll be seeing you again so have a lovely rest of the week and maybe we'll see you soon again for another charmwood forest live stream broadcast thank you